Okay, so I was just recording, uh, like a pre-recording for a webinar that I'm giving, and I thought it would be nice to give a little bit of it to put on YouTube. I'm going to be a YouTuber. Um, and basically this bit of the recording is saying, okay, what is called Aquinas Syndrome? Uh, and if I'm really obvious, it took me a, a long time to work this out. After I was practicing, I was just asking red flags, and I knew the red flags. Uh, I could say them in my sleep, sometimes in my nightmares. And I would just kind of remember the red flags. It took me ages to realize why I was actually asking them uh, and what called Requina syndrome is. So we'll go through that now. What is CES? Um, well, uh, first we have to ask what is the called Requina? Here's a picture from our book, and very proud of it we are too. Um, it's the called Requina, and you might know or you might not know that the spinal cord actually ends relatively high up and kind of the small of your back at level sort of l1 l2 the spinal cord tapers off and the rest of the room in in the spinal canal is made up by the cord equina it's kind of slightly wispy flimsy nerve roots uh, and those nerve roots are all going to go down into basically everything below the belly button so Yes, the legs and the bum and the bladder, the bowel, uh, the genitals, the saddle area, all that stuff. Um, they basically connect the central nervous system to everything below the belly button. It helps to really step back, especially if, like me, you kind of got the red flag blinkers on, to step back and think about well, what does that mean. So let's say you're drinking a lot of water and your bladder fills up and up and up. Um, the stretch receptors in the wall of your bladder and those stretch receptors will send a message up to the brain and spinal cord. And those messages have to go up the cord requina. When your brain and spinal cord know that the bladder is full, they will send messages back down in the other direction to say, okay, empty out. The bladder muscle contract, squeeze out all the urine, and those messages have to go down the cord requina. So same for the bowel. I'm full, empty out, genital, saddle, sensory information. This is what's happening down here, up to the brain, through the cord requina, and motor information. Okay, do this, do that, down the cord requina. So that's what the cord requina is. That's another set of arrows. Let's look at some pictures of it. Um, on the left, you can see what it looks like with the kind of protective thecal sac left on. Um, so that's kind of that stuff is kind of the dural well, it's a dural sac so it's contiguous with the stuff that goes around the brain and on the center and on the right you can see what it looks like with the thecal sac off so and you can see why it's called the cord requina right the horse's tail uh, another picture or another set of arrows rather just to remind you sensory stuff going up motor stuff going down um, another picture by Jose Paolo Andrade on Twitter um, I'll put a link to his stuff, amazing picture. And if you flip it on its side and cut it in half like a Swiss roll, this is what it looks like. And you can see the kind of spaghetti-like nerve roots chopped in half as well. Uh, you can also kind of notice there's a bit of extra wiggle room in there, in the thecal sac, so that it can withstand a bit of compression some of the time before things get bad. So to summarize, to answer our question, what is the cord requina? It's a bundle of nerve roots connecting the spinal cord and the brain to pretty much everything below the belly button. Okay, so that's what the cord requina is. What injures the cord requina? Well, it can be all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. So lumps, bumps, tumors, infections, aneurysms, anything that squashes it or inflames the cord requina, of course, can injure it. Most commonly, the more well, the most common cause of the really acute sort of serious cord requina syndrome that we're worried about in clinical practice is a da, 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 disc herniation. And here's some pictures of disc herniations. Um, as you probably know, the stuff inside the disc is a kind of viscousy type, sort of fluidy solid substance. Uh, people liken it to phlegm or toothpaste or porridge that kind of consistency, um, watery crabs meat, sometimes it here. Around the outside is the tough tire-like restraint of the annulus. A disc herniation, 
put very broadly, is when the watery nucleus stuff inside noses its way gradually through the tire-like annulus and finally emerges into the outside world. Some people even say, David Poulter will often say, it ejaculates. Because it's kind of, especially in younger people with a lot of kind of hydrostatic pressure in there, it can be quite a forceful emergence of this stuff into the spinal canal and crucially onto the corda equina if it's in the right position. So disc herniations can be quite angry, serious events. Uh, they can create like an inflammatory reaction as well. We hear a lot about how disc herniations can be asymptomatic and it's absolutely true, uh, but in some people they can be symptomatic and that's, that's um, as you might expect. Here's another picture by Simon Peter Perez. This is the kind of a special sort of imaging technique. Um, I think that's a sheep's disc. Um, in an experiment, you can see it extruding, as they say, out there. And here from Adams and Dolan, another similar thing from an experiment. And this, so this is the kind of thing that we can imagine coming out and pressing on the nerve roots of the quarter equina. Um, the image on the left, I think I just got from Reddit, and the right is on from Adams and Dolan. And you can imagine how that stuff can kind of occupy space. It's basically a space occupying lesion um, around the quarter equina. But how exactly does that injure the quarter equina? Well, it's not too different from something that might be going on now as you're listening to this, which is if you're sitting awkwardly on your perineal nerve or your sciatic nerve, you're squashing it. If you're squashing it, then you're stopping the blood from flowing into it. You're stopping it from getting oxygen and you'll temporarily stop it from working. You'll give yourself a conduction block. Um, it's a really common event. Uh, we do it all the time. I do it when I'm holding my phone sometimes. I just kind of squash my own nerve for so long that I get a numb sort of little finger. Um, the difference, of course, is that I can shake out my uh, elbow, shake out my wrist. You know, you can shake out your leg and restore blood flow to those nerves and everything starts working again and you forget it ever happened. With corda equina syndrome, you can't shake out a disc herniation. It's just there, sitting on the nerve roots, so that it deprives them of blood, blood can't flow in if they're being pressed enough. It deprives them of blood, deprives them of the oxygen in the blood for so long that not only do they stop working, but they also stop living. They may become damaged. The myelin sheath can sort of degenerate, the axons can't be maintained if they don't have the oxygen to live, just like any other part of your body. The nerves, or the neurons I should say, will degenerate um, and potentially even die. That's why corda equina syndrome is a surgical emergency. If something's pressing on the corda equina, like a disc herniation, you can't shake that out, you can't get it out manually, you need to do it surgically to get blood back to the nerves as quickly as possible so they can live and so someone can maintain bladder, bowel, sexual, saddle function. So let's kind of step back and take like a slightly different angle of, you know, what is this thing called requiring syndrome um, and look at some varieties of disc herniation, which might or should help us to understand a common sort of confusion or something that confused me for so long, which is, okay, why is called requiring syndrome so rare, really rare, incredibly rare, but sciatica, or radicular pain, lumbar radicular pain, is so common. And there are a few reasons, um, but broadly speaking, it's to do with where the various nerves are going. So in this picture, the, the ones at the top of your picture, L4, L5, and S1, those nerve roots are going to go into the bum and the leg. And those nerve roots are the ones that we're testing and thinking about when we test someone's reflexes, their sensation, their strength in their ankle and all that stuff. Broadly speaking, the lower sacral nerve roots, S2, 3, 4, and wispy little S5, are gonna go into the organs of the pelvis, bladder, bowel, genitals, and saddle area. So it's a, uh, a bit of a dichotomy, it's not quite that simple, but broadly speaking, L4, L5, S1, into the leg, and the others into the pelvis. Now, this matters because there is a much more common kind of disc herniation uh, that causes sciatica, and that's an off-center disc herniation. Sometimes you hear it like a paracentral, paracentral disc herniation. And these are much more 
common, the most common kind of disc herniation, and certainly the most common kind of symptomatic disc herniation. And they will sort of by anatomical necessity just contact one nerve root and it'll always be one of the nerve roots that's going into the legs. So look, here's the kind of the L5S1 disc. That's going to contact the transiting L5 root. And this disc is going to contact the S1 root. And they're both going into the legs. So these kind of common disc herniations off to the side will always, you know, almost always cause leg pain, sciatica. So really, really common, relatively common situation. Off-center disc herniation causes an injury to one single nerve root going off into the leg. Thankfully, the kind of other kind of disc herniation, a large central disc herniation is much more rare. And that's thankful because that's the kind of disc herniation that causes quadriquina syndrome. So a large central disc herniation will affect the all important nerve roots, which are going into the organs of the pelvis, the bladder, the bowel, the saddle area and the genitals. It's going to take a large central herniation to do that. And there's a few kind of biomechanical reasons for that. And there's kind of a big ligament in the way. Uh, it, and there's a lot of different reasons, but broadly speaking, it's that kind of difference between the two herniations. This kind of key thing, large central herniation causes quadriquina syndrome sometimes. It also helps to explain why bilateral sciatica is a red flag for quadriquina syndrome. It's because a large central herniation will also, as well as compressing the bundle of nerves in the middle going into the pelvis, compress the nerves on both sides going into the legs, in this case the S1. So whenever, right, whenever you hear bilateral symptoms, you always think, well, maybe this is central. Maybe it's something central causing both of them. And it's no different for when it comes to sciatica in the legs. Bilateral sciatica implies something big and nasty pressing on the whole bundle of the cord equina, um, compressing both uh, roots going into both sides. Um, so hopefully that's, oh, I think that was clear. Uh, well, I hope it was clear. I might have made it more complicated than it is. Um, but yes, bilateral sciatica is a red flag because it implies something is pressing on the bundle of the cord equina. Okay, so let's kind of summarize that bit. What injures the cord equina? The main cause of an acute injury to the cord equina is a central disc herniation. The herniation presses on the lower sacral nerve roots, which deprives them of blood and stops them from working. The longer this goes on, the more likely the damage is irreversible. Okay, um, let's see. Let's finish this with a kind of definition of quadriquina syndrome. So we've looked at what the quadriquina is, messages going up, hello, bladder is full, messages going down, okay, empty out. We've looked at the way it's injured. So typically a, a disc herniation, at least the typical cause of the serious acute quadriquina syndrome, pressing on the nerve roots and slowly depriving them of oxygen, and pressing on the whole bundle in the middle. Quadriquina syndrome, if we're gonna define it, is one or more of bladder dysfunction, bowel dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, and a loss of saddle sensation. And notice it's one or more of. So you don't need the full house by any means, you just need one card for someone to have quadriquina syndrome. And I don't say that to worry people or make them freak out. I'm just saying, you know, you don't need to check every single box. Plus or minus ridiculous pain. So this is a bit pernickety, it doesn't really matter too much, but radicular pain isn't technically a symptom of quadriquina syndrome. It's just almost always there for the ride. It almost always joins the party. 95, 99% of the time, people will also have radicular pain, AKA sciatica. They just don't necessarily have to have it. And there's a minority that don't, they just have back pain. Um, and the basis for that is that CES is really like a loss of function condition. It's a loss of function condition to the really important stuff in the pelvis. Uh, and radicular pain is just something that happens because if something is big and angry enough to press on the cord equina, it's almost certainly also going to cause sciatica. Finally, plus MRI confirmed cord equina compression. So this is a bit kind of 
maybe unexpected in some ways, especially because, you know, many things in our practice are diagnosable clinically. You don't need an MRI or an X-ray. But to make a diagnosis of CES, you need to have an MRI confirmed compression of the cord equina. And the simple reason for that is that um, the symptoms of CES are just so common. Loads of people have bladder dysfunction, loads of people have bowel dysfunction, loads of people can have every single one of those red flags and even sciatica, but it's caused by a jumble of other stuff. They've got prostate problems, they're taking gabapentin, um, you know, they've had a previous operation, all that stuff. So clinically, it's essentially impossible to tell if any given person has CES until you have that MRI. There's plenty of evidence to say that people just can't guess. Even the most experienced clinicians get it wrong. That's why you need the MRI. And the MRI will confirm CES if it confirms there's a lesion of the cord requiring typically a, a disc herniation pressing on it. Um, of course, there's kind of separate topics there. So like, well, what, what happens? What someone really seems like they have CES, but there's nothing pressing on it. In that case, look up scan negative CES research from by Ingrid Hurritzauer, really interesting stuff. And the kind of other side of the coin there is, well, what happens if someone has an MRI for some other reason, a bit of back pain, and it shows cord requiner compression, but they have no symptoms of cord requiner? Well, they don't have cord requiner syndrome without any symptoms. They have cord requiner compression, and we need to talk to them about that and safety net them, as they say, but it's not cord equina syndrome. CES is a syndrome of symptoms confirmed by MRI. Okay, so like I said at the beginning, um, this was just supposed to be a brief recording, a, a, a snippet of a presentation I'm giving. Yeah, that's the rest of it, which I'll not go into now, uh, but I hope that was useful. Maybe I'll stick it up on YouTube.